Something that took me a while to get a feel for is the correct number of clamps needed in a panel glue up. Most people assume the wider the piece is, the more clamps you need, but it's actually the opposite. Bags and Cats Moses have awesome videos on this, and the gist is that clamps direct force out at a 45 degree angle. It's crude, but imagine everything within these flying V's represents the outward clamping force. Notice these clamps are perfectly spaced and the entire joint between my two 8 inch boards falls perfectly inside these flying V's with only four total parallel clamps, meaning there is no dead space along the joint that isn't getting clamping pressure, which is exactly what you want. So while there is dead space here, here, and here, Keep in mind, there's no joint there, so it doesn't matter. Let's take a look at what happens to a cutting board glue up using the same number of clamps. Remember, all of the clamping force is on the inside of these Vs. Notice all the dead space on these joints here, here, and here that is not getting the same amount of clamping pressure that these joints are. The lesson being, the more narrow the boards, the more clamps you need because the distance from this joint to the clamp phase is shorter in math or something. I would add three more clamps to this glue up for a total of seven clamps on this cutting board. Chances are you would be fine with less clamps, but you do run the risk of these joints eventually failing or applying too much pressure, which leads to cupped panels. Drill bits. We all have them, but it seems like I rarely use them for drilling a hole in things. I'm currently building a bulldozer bed for my son. Now, these treads will overlay three eighths of an inch on both sides. And the really difficult way to do that would be marking a line on each piece and then trying to line it up. Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. The key is to raise the wheel 3 eighths of an inch off the top of the assembly table and then use this surface as a stop block of sorts. Instead of fussing with finding a board that thickness, I'll just use two 3 eighths drill bits and double side tape them to my bench. I'm not actually going to nail these, I still need to paint. But you get the point. There are companies that sell really expensive setup blocks for tasks like setting the blade height on your table saw, but you guessed it, drill bits work too. Seriously, the possibilities seem endless when you realize that you have very accurate dimensions in small increments at your disposal. Let's say you want to set the depth of your plunge router to 9 64 of an inch. Grab that drill bit and use it to set your stop accordingly. Chris and Sean at Four Eyes had a really great tip in a recent video about using a drill bit instead of a kerf maker on your table saw, but it's so good I think it's worth sharing again. Let's say you're trying to cut a dado. Simply line up where you want your dado to begin, then using the same material that will slide into the dado as a spacer, place that on the side of your piece and set up a stop block. Make a cut, then remove the spacer. Slide your workpiece over and add a drill bit in between your workpiece and the stop block. The drill bit should be the same thickness as your blade kerf. Mine is an eighth of an inch. And finally, hog out the remaining material. Bada bing, perfect dado. Now, if you don't account for your blade kerf, the dado will be one blade kerf too wide. All right, we can't keep talking about drill bits without actually drilling into something. If you're drilling a hole and it needs to be 90 degrees, just put your drill bit into the corner of two boards and then use that as a guide. I don't often use screws, but when I do, I like to make them part of the design. A nice way to do this is by plugging the screw holes with a contrasting wood. Instead of using a traditional countersink bit, I use a half inch Forstner bit to recess my screw and then cover it up with a wood plug to prevent the Forstner bit from walking and potentially tearing out, which happens, trust me. Make a simple guide using the same bit and a scrap piece of wood. Then using the guide, line up your location and drill down to your desired depth. No tear out and a nice clean hole even on softwoods. Rather than taking time to cut out a bunch of plugs, I buy them in bulk, aisle 5 at Costco. If they're sold out, there's a company online called Widget Co. that sells these for a very reasonable price and they're all face grain instead of end grain like dowels. Okay, back to the routers. Plunge routers like this one come with a base that is partially round and flat. When running the router along a temporary fence to cut a dado or groove, you should use the flat side, right? Wrong, 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 wrong. Here's why. Any potential twisting from either the front of the base or the back of the base will change the router bit's relationship to the fence, and your cut will be all out of whack. Conversely, the rounded side of the base not only creates less friction, but also makes it very difficult to mess up your cut thanks to math and science. Your router bit position relative to the fence won't change even if your base pivots along the fence. You can see the difference in these two dados. One looks like when I try and hand cut dovetails and the other is basically perfect. 
And if you're wondering which direction to move your router and avoid climb cutting, which is dangerous if not done properly, take your right hand like so and place your thumb against the fence or the edge of the piece. And this will be your feed direction. Woodworking is all about repeatability. And it seems that I'm always running into situations when cutting out project parts that I need to pause and cut something else, or I need to cut the exact same piece later on because I messed something up. Yeah. I make a lot of mistakes. Instead of eyeballing exactly where your fence is and trying to replicate that later on, grab a clamp or a magnet and set a stop so you can come back to the same fence position again. As the channel has grown and I look to keep myself in business without burdening you with sponsor segments, I'm expanding my merchandise available on the Etsy store. Every video I will be adding a new t-shirt with kind of funny lines from previous videos, available for a limited time. First up, one of my favorites, just a dummy in a garage. So help support the channel and get yourself some limited edition swag. And if you have any great tips and tricks, leave them in the comments below and if I include it in the next video, I'll send you some merch. All right, I'm freezing. I need to change shirts. Equally as important as repeatability is avoiding measuring whenever possible. Let's use half laps as the example here. Instead of trying to find the exact center of these boards and then using that line to set the blade height accordingly, I won't measure at all. Instead, I'll lower the blade to just barely below halfway, make a cut, then flip the board over and repeat. Finally, I'll raise the blade until my final cut just barely removes this little sliver. And that will give you perfect half laps every time. Here's a quick tip to save a lot of people the time and energy of writing useless comments. Whenever I or any other YouTuber mentions wacky imperial fractions in a video like 964, inevitably the comment section lights up with profound statements about switching to the metric system, as if we weren't aware it even exists. But guess what? We grew up with Imperial and don't care if it's more complicated. It's what we know. We're stubborn. We aren't changing. This is my home! <laughs> Most people end up falling out of love with their miter saw, but here's some advice to help you with your own couples therapy. No matter what you do, these are notorious for bad dust collection, even with a hood and the vacuum turned on. If you're going to be making a lot of cuts, set up a small fan so it blows everything back towards the dust chute or into the box. Let's say you need to trim off just a tiny sliver from the end of your board while you're sneaking up on a fit. Get a scrap piece of something flat and then place your workpiece on top of that. With the saw blade lowered, push your workpiece into the side of the blade and then turn the saw on and slowly raise it up. That should shave off just enough and repeat as needed. If you're wondering what the point of this board was, it'll raise your piece up enough so it's only contacting the side of the blade and it's not touching the blade tooth. If your piece is in contact with the blade tooth while the saw kicks on, it'll shift your piece just slightly leaving you a less than square cut. Okay, now I'm turning off the camera now. Bye!